How you doing? Good. Random, I know. <laughs> this is what you do when you're bored at home. <laughs> First off, don't make your side seams look all janky on your t-shirts with mismatched thread like I used to do. Oh, the struggle was real. I've got eight sewing tips for beginners or for people who were just getting into tailoring their own clothes that are gonna save you so much time and frustration. I'm SD, I don't like long intros though. Let's, uh, let's do this. Cut your threads when you are finished sewing a new stitch. I have a dress shirt from like five years ago. It was, uh, it was one of the very first dress shirts that I've ever tailored myself. It's this one right here. And yeah, it still has the threads dangling on it. I've worn this shirt like 700 times. I've worn it to weddings, I've worn it on dates, all that kind of stuff. I love it. I got it at JCPenney's. It was like 20 bucks, but as little, little as anybody know, um, you got all these like dangly threads down here. I didn't even cut these off. I left the straight stitch. I left the zigzag stitch on there. Like it would have taken me two seconds to do. And it's funny because after kind of like looking into it and doing some, doing a little bit more digging, I realized this used to be kind of a prevalent problem because did the same thing on this shirt right here. I have one strand on this one. Let me just focus that guy. There we go. I have one strand on this one in it. Why? Why? I cut off some of them, but I didn't cut off all of them. So don't be SD. Cut off those threads from that straight stitch and that zigzag stitch. It's just looks so unprofessional. Yeah, nobody's gonna notice in a million years, but you will. Oh, and quick question, you're uh, you're using the right scissors, right? As in you're not using some random pair of utility scissors you uh you found in your drawer? Yeah? Okay, good. Your thread, yes, pull it properly out of your machine. Now when you wanna change the color of your thread or use a different type of thread, make sure that you pull that thread yeah, you got you gotta pull it out of your machine the right way. You wanna make sure that you cut it at the top and then pull it out. Why? Well, because if you're like me, you ended up pulling that thread up through the needle, which ends up causing a whole bunch of lint. And it's kind of like, uh, um, it's kind of like, you know, your dryer lint trap. Not the end of the world if you forget once or twice, but if you keep doing that, it can kind of add up and it can cause a fire. No, your sewing machine's not gonna catch fire if all that lint starts to accumulate, but it will break it. That's not true, it's totally gonna catch fire from all those lit AF dress shirts you're gonna end up tailoring. I think I'm way too old to say lit AF, but meh is what it is. You ready for this one? Pay attention to your take-up lever. Your take-up lever is that little hook inside of your machine and it can kind of hide on you if you don't know that it's there or if you don't know where to look. And you might be blaming your bobbin for all that, uh, all that bunching you have going on underneath your garment, but mm, it's actually not your bobbin's fault. This one is so common and I still make this mistake myself uh, on a semi-regular basis. Make sure you actually put your thread through the take-up lever. Man, I could not tell you the number of times I have tailored something and my machine starts struggling and grinding. And so I go, what I do is I go and I check the bobbin 56 times and I replace it 56 times. Only to then realize that it was never my thread in the first place, it was my take-up lever. Did that and then it was smooth sailing. This is what you're gonna find on more higher-end machines. So we got we got our crank over here. And let's, let's take a look at this take-up lever. Oh. Well, where, where is it? Where is it at though? Where is it at though? Okay, there it is. But see, notice how it doesn't come up nearly as high as it does on the net And You might look at it and be like, oh my gosh, what did I do? Did I like break it, take it out of the box? What's going on? No, 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 no. Just relax. This is, this is how these ones work. So you got your thread, you're running it over here like you normally would, la 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 la. And then you come down this way and then you thread it up there and you come up here. But whoa, whoa, here's where the biggest difference is. You see that little piece of plastic in there? It actually does it loops it uh, onto that little hook there automatically for you. You just kind of push it and then it's on there and then you come down. So you don't ever have to worry about not putting your thread on there and then messing up down here. You're sitting there messing with your bobbin. Like what's going on? Why am I not stitching properly? 90% of all sewing issues can be solved by checking your take up lever. And 56% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Always, always, always and I mean always use a back stitch. When you are sewing a straight stitch or a zigzag stitch, it is incredibly strong and durable. And in fact, it's just as strong as the stitch
pitch was when you bought it. But it's only as strong as its weakest link, which is the beginning and the end of your stitch. You, my friend, you wanna make sure you lock in that stitch properly by holding down your back stitch lever for one, maybe two seconds to nice and make it down nice and locked in. If you drop the ball on that step, what could end up happening is your stitch can actually unravel and it's most likely gonna happen at the most random time ever. Like when you're at work giving a presentation in that DIY tailored dress shirt that you're wearing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's awkward. This one is quite near and dear to my heart. Buy the machine that you can afford the first time. It's near and dear to my heart because yo, I totally get it. I completely understand. I'm the type of person where I would rather buy something that's like relatively inexpensive or like the, the medium level. I'd rather buy that thing multiple times instead of buy a more expensive version of that particular thing once. Buying a cheap sewing machine is totally fine. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what's gonna end up happening is you're going to develop an addiction. You just are. And you're gonna end up outgrowing that cheaper sewing machine way faster than you realize you're going to. As in like, you're gonna use it for a month and then you're gonna be like, why didn't I just drop a little bit more coin on an expensive machine? I've got a Nechi FA16, which is great, but it kinda sorta struggles on thicker materials. It can do them, but it's, it ain't happy about it. It ends up kinda going <laughs> The difference between this machine and the Nechi FA16 that I've been using for a number of years is completely night and day. They're actually relatively close in price. I mean, they're close to together and this thing oh my gosh this thing eats through anything this thing glides through anything that I've thrown at it like butter so if you're in the market for a new machine and you're thinking about getting a good one just get this because this is an example I in the beginning I never would have paid for something like this I would have been like no that's way too expensive I'd rather just go find a used sewing machine for like $40 and I would have got frustrated in the beginning and I would have just said nope tailoring is stupid it's way too hard well no it's not hard it's just that I didn't get the proper machine that I should have got from the beginning so I would have swore it off completely you don't need anything fancy it doesn't have to be computerized in order to have to have a variety of different stitches on this channel we usually only do two stitches, uh, one of which is actually optional sometimes. A straight stitch and a zigzag stitch. So you want to look for and find a machine that can do both of those stitches, which pretty much all of them can, and then you're good. Remember that take-up lever that we were talking about a couple of minutes ago? Yeah, before you start sewing, make sure that it's all the way at the top. When it is at the top, that means that your needle is at its highest point too, which means that when you start sewing your thread, it's way less likely to come out when you start. I still forget that one from time to time, as in when I'm making tutorial videos to put on YouTube on how to put darts in a dress shirt. So, um, yeah, that, that was fun. Funny thing is, is you wouldn't have even noticed it had I not pointed it out. <laughs> and now you're gonna go back and watch that video and be like, oh yeah, he did make that mistake. Again, wait till the end, cause watch time. There is a handle or a dial or a crank on your machine that actually controls the needle when you spin it now you wanna make sure you do the right thing with it. What's that you might ask? Well, you wanna make sure that you turn it the right way, which is always, always towards you. Not the wrong way, which is away from you. It is not good for your machine if you turn it the wrong way. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like the gears or the mechanisms in your car. The transmission in my 2011 Chevy Cruze controls my car and makes it go forward. This is kind of an ironic analogy since my transmission is slipping. Now those same gears in my transmission will make my car go in reverse just fine, but not for long periods of time. It's, it's not really a fan of that. It's gonna end up burning out my transmission after a while, which it's already burning out as it is, I guess. Well, it's the same with your sewing machine. You can turn that dial the wrong way every once in a while, but it's not really a habit that you wanna develop because the next thing you know, time's gonna go on, you've been doing it for a while, and then you end up breaking that expensive sewing machine. Change your needle way more often than you think. They do not last forever, and in fact, they don't really last that long at all. The usual professional rule of thumb is you wanna change your sewing machine needle every eight hours. But in my mind, it's like, who actually, you know, sets a timer for eight hours when they're sewing. No, that's weird. You're a weirdo if you do that. So instead, this is my go-to. Ask yourself one question and one question only. Did you go on a tailoring binge? Yeah. Did you spend your Sunday afternoon tailoring three dress shirts, five pairs of chinos, and two pairs of jeans? Yeah. Mm, then change your needle. Universal needles are your usual go-to, and yo, you can get those things at Walmart. 
for like $4 for a pack of six. I would say try Joanne Fabrics too, but A, they're closed right now, and B, not really a huge fan of that place. Had kind of a bad experience. But that being said, yeah, Walmart actually has a lot of different pretty good sewing accessories, and no, this is not some awkward segue into a sponsorship. I've gotten the majority of my accessories there now. They end up selling denim needles, they sell stretch needles, they sell universal needles, they sell all kinds of thread, like the sky is the limit. So if you're just getting started and you're kind of intimidated and you want to just like dive into it, just kind of sprinkle yourself in, it doesn't really make any sense, but uh, go check out that place. So you're probably wondering why there was such a giant shift in tone and color and sound and all that. Uh, here's what happened. I'm editing this video that you're watching currently right now and hands down the worst possible thing could have happened. Well, one of the worst possible things could have happened. I got everything done. I got all my sound edited, got my sound effects put in there, music, everything. And I'm finished in its 10 minutes and three seconds. Now, the reason why I despise that number with a passion is because anybody and everybody knows that if you see a video that's 10 minutes and three seconds or 10 minutes and 30 seconds or whatever it is, that basically just means that they took a, they took a topic that's like two or three minutes long and just stretched it out to 10 minutes. Now don't get me wrong, mid-roll ads are great. I think they're fantastic. This video very well might have a mid-roll ad on it, but they have their place. Mid-roll ads should be put on a video when the video is purposely, or not purposely, when it's actually relevant to being the length that it is. To give you an example, I search on YouTube just like everybody else does, and I will not watch a video that's 10 minutes and whatever seconds. If I see a video that is seven or eight minutes, I'll watch that video, or if it's, let's say, 13, 14, or 15 minutes, I'll watch that video too. But if it's 10 minutes and anywhere around there at all, absolutely not. I'm gonna keep scrolling and I'm gonna find something else. So then I was presented with the problem of, oh, okay, well, I already cut everything that I possibly can out. Otherwise, if I cut anything else out, I'm gonna lose a bunch of context. So what do I do? Well, I'm gonna take this opportunity to say thank you because I just checked uh, I just checked my uh, YouTube studio a couple minutes ago and we hit 80,000 subscribers a few minutes ago and that I think is just dope. Turns out that a lot of other people just like me hate wearing baggy clothes and they now realize that there's an easy fix for that. Just learn how to use a sewing machine. I still get a ton of pushback and I get made fun of all the time by my friends or people that I know or used to work with, but joke's on them. How many people in Ukraine or Germany or Idaho or Indiana or Canada watched all their videos? Oh, oh, that's right. Nobody did. And now that you are all set up to go on a mm, banging tailoring binge, let's uh, let's go learn your sewing machine, huh? Let's go do that. SD out.